Welcome to the Seller Roundtable e-commerce coaching and business strategies with Andy Arnott and Amy Wees. Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Andy Arnott with Amy Wees. And we are super excited to have Kaylee, Caleb Gilliam's on. Look, I screwed, I screwed up your first name. I, I got your, your and last name. And the last name. name. Yeah. Wait, it's yeah, Williams. Williams. Didn't get my last name Williams. Right either. Oh, I, didn't, oh, I totally Williams. butchered it then. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I've heard, Double I've heard it worse. <laughs> but I will say most people don't mess up the first name, but you know. Yeah, I'll yeah. I, 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 I butchered that one this time too. Um, but you know what people that's part of, of growing wealth, right. Is having some failure. So I will own that failure, wear it as a badge of honor. Uh, Caleb, thank you so much for being on today and, uh, super excited to have you on. Uh, I know that Amy and I, we are late in our financial literacy game and I wish I was early. I wish I was your age when I started, because I know that my life would have been completely different in terms of finances. I know that my wife and I are completely passionate and dedicated to teaching our children financial literacy early on. Uh, on that note, tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're born. I, I already know where you're born. And, uh, you know, I guess you got to share that with everyone, you know, maybe tell people where you live now, past jobs, college, school, you know, that you're a silly Packers fan, you know, all that, you know, super important stuff. Yeah. So I'll say this, normally I don't go into this much detail, but I was born in the great state of Wisconsin. Um, Woo! Not a huge- not a huge fan of the weather, though, <laughs> but Me a fan neither. Of, of the Green Bay Packers. And um, it's, it's funny. I, I tell people the best and worst stock I own is Green Bay Packers stock because it's priceless and worthless at the same time. Try to figure that out. Uh, but, but anyways, I, uh, I, I grew up in an amazing household. I was actually the oldest of six kids. My um, parents homeschooled me. My dad is a PhD molecular biologist. I wanted to be a doctor until I took biology one. And I'm like, uh, I, something happened uh, with my dad's DNA sk- skipping over me. Um, and so I had to figure something out and uh, actually got fascinated with how money works at a very young age. I, was, I think I might have like hit my head when I was young because uh, I've always been pretty frugal. And, um, and so I've just been super fascinated with, with money ever since. Got a job at a uh, chicken farm. And I literally gutted chickens. I, I'm, I apologize if any, anyone listening to this is vegan, but I have an appreciation for a chicken sandwich like none other. And I started making money. And then I'm like, you know what? With this money, I can start doing some amazing things. And so I started reading about often trading stocks. I, I learned about gold and inflation and all this kind of stuff. And I realized, and I couldn't articulate it at the time, but I realized that if we could get our money thing figured out, our life could be radically different, radically different. And, and so I kind of dedicated this, this time in my life that I wanted to do something. It's funny, Robert Kiyosaki's books were one of the first books I've read, uh, along with The Richest Man in Babylon. I read books led by Jim Collins on leadership, uh, Think and Grow Rich, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. So I kind of had like three kind of books that I re- read around leadership, self-development, money. And that led me to getting a job at 17 years old at, at a community bank. And I worked there, worked in multiple departments. At the age of 19, I became one of the youngest people to take over the, the full bank's investment department. And that's where, number one, uh, if you think I look young now, huh, just, just think, think about what I looked at at 19. Uh, it was brutal. I call it, people had the 10 minutes of horror when they walked into the bank and wanted to, to do their investment planning. And then they met me and they just assumed that I was like the assistant. And then when I shut the door behind them, they're like, They just had like a holy crap moment where they're like, oh no. Um, And so I learned a lot. I learned a lot of what not to say. I learned a lot about what to say and how to communicate with people. But more importantly, I had this dedication in my heart to want to learn the very best things as it relates to money. And uh, newsflash, we're not being taught about money. And there's a lot of things that are going on behind the scenes that nobody wants to tell us. And it's funny because if you look at who's actually winning, who's actually profiting, the banks, Wall Street, like they're doing the exact opposite of what we're teaching us. And so I'm, I'm a little bit of a contrary, uh, contrary, contrarian thinker. And I, I just like am a passionate about helping people get results and like become like live a wealthy life. And I'm realizing that you really have to have an understanding of how money works. And then you can take that and you can take it to business. You can take it to the buying gold. You can take it to buying real estate and you can take it to just life in general. And I just find that there's a lot of people that are talking about tactics. Almost everybody's talking about tactics, but it's hard to take a step back and saying like, no, what is the actual purpose? And so what I would love to do is talk about the framework before then we go. And then we, once we get the framework, then we can talk about literally anything that you want, because 
uh, when you get a solid foundation, you can build anything. Awesome. I yeah. love this conversation so much. I just want to say that. No, for sure. <laughs> I love yeah. your energy so much. Uh, we'll, we'll have part two about all the Packers and, and, uh, and no, how we'll, they broke we'll, my we'll heart. Skip, no, we'll skip over that one. No, I'm just <laughs> kidding. <laughs> I'm actually not a Packers hater. I'm just a 49ers fan. So, you know, uh, any other teams to me are dead. You know, I, I, we don't talk about them. Um, Caleb, is there any specific event? I know you kind of gave us a background, but is there anything like, you know, when you were starting out doing the financial literacy thing, like, is it, was there like somebody you helped or something that you did that you were like, okay, I can, I can really have some impact here. Um, you know, any events or any, anything that comes into your, your head about like, you know, specific event that where you were like, okay, yeah, I'm all in on this. Yeah. Two, two events, one's pre-bank, one's at, at the bank. So pre-bank 13 year old Caleb has a most embarrassing moment. I'm dyslexic, super short for my age, totally blank in front of my peer group, totally forget what I'm going to say. What makes matters worse is I had my two lines written down on a note card and I painfully sounded out every single word. Walked, walked off that stage and just felt defeated. I went to my mom the next day and she said, Caleb, the things that you can't control, like your height, don't worry about. The things that you can control, like how you show up and how you work at your reading and other things, you have to go all in and don't be a victim. And so I, at 12, 13 years old, put on this, like, I am going to take control over my life in the areas that I can, which by the way is most, and the things that I can, I'm not going to spend time worrying about. So that is very much a foundational aspect of what I believe about everything. And especially with our money is there are things like future taxes, future inflation. There's things that we don't necessarily have control over, but we can control how we show up in those environments. And then the second thing is I, I, I always joke about one out of every five people that come to, to work with us at Better Wealth uh, ends up crying their first meeting. And one of the things that was just really impactful to me is when I first started at, at the bank, um, I'm going to make up a word here, but I really believe that people are their number one asset. And I, the, one of the big reasons why I'm such anti-typical financial planning is I feel like most people are doing the exact opposite and devaluing their number one asset. When I think about your number one asset, it's a function of your abilities, your time, and, and your resources. And, and a lot of people, in the way that they think about their money, the way that they're showing up, are not stewarding them well. And so we're taught things like go after a great rate of return, but you're just being seduced by this rate of return aspect and not actually designing your life in the way that you want. And so I saw that, and that really motivated me to really be like, man, there's got to be a better way. And ultimately, I end up leaving the bank at 21 years old, starting Better Wealth, and now we're in almost all 50 states. We have over 15 people internal and we have networks all across the country. And it's because I think people buy into what we're teaching and we're just very much on, you're not wealthy if you're not living intentionally. And I picked up all these aspects as I just started looking at people. And I looked at people that worked extremely hard because they didn't know the rules of the game and they didn't know, understand money as a tool. They turned their brain off as it relates to the financial side and on, on unfortunately are living unintentionally in certain areas in their life because of that. I think that that's one of the, one of the things that, that, um, you know, I noticed it with myself, you know, like I said, we got late with, uh, you know, got on board late with financial literacy, which I think a lot of people in my age group did because we, there was nobody like you, uh, or Robert Kiyosaki, things like that, you know, when we were younger to, to look at, to, you know, that, that we're sharing those, you know, kind of insights and those, things. And it's kind of the same thing, like with Amy and I doing this podcast, you know, I feel like now people, you know, used to keep a lot of those kinds of things secret, right? Like these are the tricks of the game and I have to keep them secret. I can't share them with anyone. And I feel that more and more people are, you know, who are an expert and have a passion for what they're doing are, are really sharing and, and, you know, doing a, a you know, more of a, a help mentality, which I think is awesome. But, you know, before we move any further, before, if you're in your twenties and you haven't read, you know, rich dad, poor dad, and you know, richest man in Babylon, you know, the, the books that Caleb mentioned, literally, uh, I hate to say this, but turn this off right now and go read that and then come back because those are literally going to change your whole perspective on money and wealth. And, you know, before you had that information, you're, you're literally, you know, like a person wandering around in the dark when it comes to your money, you really need some of these really basic foundational things in order to kind of get a target and, and get a mindset of, you know, putting your money to work, uh, uh, you know, for you, like, like Caleb mentioned on that same note, Caleb, 
you know, we have a ton of, uh, a lot of people, we, we have a, a wide variety of people that listen to the show, right? People are just starting out. We have a lot of that, but we also have some, you know, people have been in the game for a while in terms of Amazon or e-commerce. And then we have people who are, you know, seasoned and, and, you know, just want to get like the high level stuff. Right. So we got the, the, the wide variety here, but in terms of, you know, somebody just starting out um, or in terms of somebody who's been here for a while, any like tips that you can say in terms of profitability for running a, a business, what should, you know, people running a business, entrepreneurs right now, wh what are a few things that, uh, you know, people should do to get to profitability? Yeah. And, and if you, if you would like, I would love to spend like one minute just going over Robert Kiyosaki's work. Cause I think there's some fundamental. Abs absolutely. No, okay. I love, I love to hear people uh, dissect that and, 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 you know, yeah. what you got from that. Absolutely. I'd love to hear so, that. So one of the things that Robert Kiyosaki is known for doing, and, and there's two, two things I want to touch on. Number one is he talks about um, this concept of like working at like a you know w2 job versus like building a business and and early on in the book he talks about working for free but creating value and that is so important because if you look at my life i said no to a lot of areas that i could have made more money in the short term but i knew that working at the bank and getting mentored was going to be far greater and then when i took over the bank's investment department i spent a lot of money and traveled the country and learned from people and and spent money didn't get paid anything to learn and I figure, like, I, I very much have a lot of rich dads um, in my life that have taught me. And so that's been super valuable. The other thing is his metric for financial freedom. Um, he's noted for saying that financial independence is when you have enough assets. And he defines an asset as anything that produces cash flow passively. So he uses real estate, which is real estate's a great asset. It's not the only asset that you can own that can produce passive cash flow. But he, he, he defines you're financially free when you have enough assets that are producing passive income that income is greater than your expenses. So you're essentially, you don't need to work, you're living your life and you're having assets do that instead of you working. And he talks about four quadrants and he talks about a lot of people are stuck in the employment um, quadrant or the self-employment, which I like to call the slavery, when you're a slave to your own business. And I, I, I would say a lot of people listening to this are probably in the S quadrant. And one of the things that Robert Kiyosaki talks a lot about is we need to start thinking about the the more passive areas and he breaks down business which that's that's what i'm building and so when you ask about gold like it's all going to go back for me in my life right now business is my thing and so i'm everything that i do i'm building wealth through business but then the other area is assets and investments and that's where it could literally be you know a business it could be real estate it could be other things like gold and so that's just gives an overview i would highly recommend you check out Robert Kiyosaki's work because it will give you the philosophy and the mindset and I'm where I am because I've read books like that. And so to, to answer your next question, it's all, I, I feel like the number one mistake people are making is they're not clear on what they actually want. Um, if, you're, if you're taking notes, write the word ROR down. And in, in, in Wall Street, in typical financial planning, ROR stands for rate of return or return on risk. And so we are taught to literally, if something will give you a better rate of return than, than this or this, we tend to just go with whatever can get you a better rate of return. What, what, I, what I love to challenge people is instead of rate, it being rate of return, what if it was return on result? So for instance, Amy, what if, you design, what if you got super clear on what you actually wanted? What if you could answer the question, if money wasn't an issue at all, what would you be doing? And you got clear on what, what financial freedom looks like, what results are you seeking? And then whatever you do with your time, money, and abilities should be to back up that. And what's important is a lot of times we ask people what they want and they don't eat, no one's ever asked them that. The education system is not teaching us how to ask that. And so the first thing that we do and the biggest mistake that I see is I can give you a lot of tactics. I can talk about my book, The End Asset, and talk about how we're doing efficiency hacks when it comes to taxes and how to you know, leverage your savings and all these amazing things. And tactics do not matter if you don't know where you wanna go. And so that's, that's the biggest mistake is like, is a 401k good or bad? It all depends. And it really depends on how you answer question number one. What results are you looking for and where do you want to go? And then I can tell you what you should do with your cash flow assets and liabilities based on what you're telling me. It's like, it's the biggest reason I think for people staying in that self-employed mode is, and I love the cash flow quadrant, by the way, it's one of my favorite books after I was mad that I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad so late in life. Like I was mad because I was the daughter of Poor Dad. Like, you know, that was me. That's how, and that's how most of us grew up, honestly. But 
Um, I think in business, what a lot of people are doing is, and I see this with my clients, is they are not focusing on what the end goal is. They're just trying to start, but they don't know what the end goal is. Yeah. So how do you get there if you have no vision, you know, how do you set goals and reach them? And you just feel like you're spinning your wheels every day in your business because you have no goals and you have no end goal. Yeah. And so I, I feel like, like you're saying in your life, you know, where do you want to be? What is that result that you want to achieve? What do you want your life to be like every single day? You know, what does financial freedom mean? And, you know, for me, I absolutely love what I do. So I often have a hard time not staying self-employed <laughs> because yeah. I want to do it every day. I love it. But, uh, but at the same time, I do realize that, you know, is it, is it my purpose? Is it the end goal? And am I focusing on the end goal or am I staying yeah. in the spinning my wheels side of things? Yeah. So such yeah. a good point. Most people have no clue on where they want to go. And so literally any road will get you there. And I want you to hear that. And I want that to sink in because again, not, none of what Robert talks about, what I talk about, what you guys talk about will matter. We don't have an idea of where we want to go. Yeah, absolutely, Caleb. And, and you kind of transitioned into my next question, which I, I, kind of, I, I kind of prompted early on before we started, but I am interested. So you said you're investing in your own business. So do you have any other assets that you're currently investing in, in terms of, are you doing gold, silver, you know, and I also would love to hear your, uh, you know, your take on the next six months, you know, in terms of, of economy stocks, things like that, because that's what I'm really looking at right now and really interested in and, and looking at kind of the data and, and kind of, you know, trying to figure it out for myself, which I think a lot of other people are um, for, you know, what's, what's coming. And if people don't know what's coming, you know, in my opinion, it, it's, it's going to be bleak at least, you know, in the, in the short term, but I would love to hear kind of your take on that. Yep. I'll answer that in two parts. So part number one is I spend a lot of time on efficiency. I feel like no one wants to talk about it because it's way more um, fun to talk about where you put your money and not about like keeping more. So I have a very good tax strategy um, that I pay very little in taxes. And so that's, what, that's one thing I find that a lot of people need to focus on because um, you could pay up to 40. And by the way, Andy, maybe 50% with your, where you're living oh. um, to ta taxes. And it's like, okay, I can, I can talk to about where you put your money, but figure out a way to minimize that. Um, and then also just start tracking your cash flow and ask a, and do an audit on all your assets and all your liabilities. And there are hacks on like, I can, I can tell people what good debt versus bad debt is. And we can very much have a, a checklist on should you own this asset or you should transfer this asset to something else. And so that's good to know. And it's all about being efficient and looking back on where you are. And one of the things that we offer is a, an x-ray of just literally like we have a free tool that's like you can go and you can see like what you're currently doing, how you're being aligned. And it's just really, it's very eye opening. And so number one, it's all about efficiency. Number two, and this is, this is a very, this will open up a can of worms. I don't always go into this on podcast, but I actually save a ton of money into a special type of overfunded life insurance strategy. Okay. Now, now hear me out before we get into the details here. I do not see life insurance as an investment and 99% of it's garbage. So what you hear on the internet is true 99% of the time. What, what I realized through going through the bank and learning is, is banks, corporations, and the ultra wealthy use it. They don't use it as an investment. They use it as a storehouse. Why do they use it as a storehouse? When you reverse the rules and you try to put as much money in and get as little insurance as possible, you're creating a contract that essentially allows your money once put in to grow tax-free like a Roth, be used tax-free on whatever you want, which I'll go into next, and get passed on tax-free to the next generation. So one of the things that I do with our investments and what we specialize at Better Wealth is whatever what, what we invest in, which we'll talk about next, I'm teaching people how to put it into a foundational asset. My book is called The And Asset. Because I believe if you can give a dollar more than one job, that's what the banks are doing. That's what the wealthy do. And if we understand how to properly leverage all the money that comes through our life, we will by default win in the end. So um, I save over six figures a year just in contracts like that. And then the next part is because, because we can leverage our money, because what, what I call in my the book controlled compounding, because I can use capital and but my money continues to grow. Now I have, a, I have an obligation to invest that somewhere. So um, a cu couple of common investments. We have a lot of people doing real estate. There, there are, are real estate strategies that 
uh, give you just a ton of advantages. And if you think about real estate, real estate's attractive because you can use leverage to acquire it. It will most likely grow in value. It will hopefully cash flow. Um, and you get special tax benefits, depreciation, you know, accelerated depreciation. So real estate has been used as an amazing asset. And I would be doing real estate if my focus wasn't building businesses. Um, because I'm super clear on, on what I want out of life and my business is getting me far greater than 100% rate of return, I'm using my and asset strategy to gr save my money for the future in a tax advantage way and also fund the things that I'm really passionate about and 10Xing in my business. So if you're listening to this and you're into uh, you know, Amazon strategies and like maybe that's the investment and you just need to find more efficiency in how to do what you're currently doing. Gold, here, here's my philosophy with gold. Obviously, if you've invested in gold the last couple of months, you would have done really well. Um, it's a hedge against inflation. Our government's printing money, like it's going out of style. And so there's, there's attractiveness to gold. What I always say when it comes to inflation is value, value creation is the ultimate hedge versus inflation. So how I think about this is, yes, gold is, is a thing. I don't focus a ton on gold. I focus a ton on like if, if inflation or hyperinflation came, which inflation is just the value of our dollar getting less and less valuable. If that happened, um, the, the people that would be okay are the people that could be self-sufficient or the people that could be offering a service or a product that could get transferred because it, you could a million dollars might not be worth a ton, if you're, if you're creating value, you will always be able to realize that. And so I think in words of value creation versus like gold, but um, gold's a really smart hedge versus inflation. And, um, and so that's my like, that's like my overview of my investment philosophy. And, and we obviously I'm expecting more questions because I opened up a can of worms a couple areas. No, no, that, I actually think that that's great. And I, I love, I, I love the, uh, you know, the value prop, right? The, the whole thing about, you know, uh, you know, there is wealth and value in terms of what you're providing. And, and I think that's true, you know, in ter if you build something that everybody wants, uh, you know, in terms of a business or something like that, you know, even if the economy goes down, if you've built um, you know, a business that continues to provide value, um, you know, I, I think that anybody who does that is going to be fine, even with a, a, a big downturn. Um, my, my, my interest in gold is exactly what you said, just because the inflation, right, with all this money that we're giving away right now uh, from the government, I'm just terrified of my dollars becoming worth less and less and less. Now we generally do real estate. That's our, you know, my, my I'm doing the Amazon thing and, and the entrepreneurial thing. My wife's doing the real estate thing. So that's really where we're going to focus on. But in the midterm, I hate my cash just sitting in the bank. Um, so that's why we're, we're doing some gold and silver right now. But I love, absolutely love the, the talk about, uh, about value. Yep. Yep. A absolutely. And, and what I would say is um, I will send you my book, The End Asset. And I would love to get your thoughts on it because that is a better place to store capital for the long-term tax advantage and also leverage it to do things like real estate and other things. And so um, I, I a hundred percent agree. And also a thing to talk, just, you know, mention is real estate is also a hedge versus inflation because everyone needs a place to live. And so if, if there's hyperinflation, well, if you own a uh, physical asset and you know, it's not like, it's not like the earth is expanding. So, um, so yeah, it's just an interesting, interesting thought. Awesome. I would love to get into the business side of things, right? You talked about how you're helping build businesses. You know, so many of our business owners in this country are just, the numbers are a problem, right? Yep. Um, I have coaching calls all the time with clients. We run their numbers and some of them are losing money with every sale. And it's so, so, so important, you know, I mean, what are some foundational things that entrepreneurs can do to ensure that they're building something that is going to give them that rate of results, right? That return on their results, yeah. right? I love that. Um, yeah. yeah. What are some things that they can do when they're first starting their business and as they're growing their business to, um, to be more successful and to be set up where they're not, um, they're not really just keeping... I think a lot of them, they get stuck in this situation where they just keep digging, keep yep. borrowing, and they just, yep. they get under, you know, they're, <laughs> it's, it's a mess. So yeah, yeah, would love to hear your take on that. Yeah. So anytime I answer questions like this, I want to separate the what versus the how. And so right now we're going to talk about what, what you do. And I think a big 
problem that I see a lot of people having is they, we don't understand uh, supply and demand. And so uh, I have a lot, of, a lot of friends that went to college, they, something that they were super passionate about, and then they're like wondering why they're unemployed. Well, the market doesn't necessarily value the skills that you're articulating. Um, I, I had um, uh, Dave Meltzer on my podcast and I asked him a value question and he said, yeah, money follows value, but actually it goes one step deeper. It says um, money, quantitative value. If someone can quantitate your value, that's, that's the real, because you might think you're valuable. Everyone's valuable. It's just, if someone doesn't see that value, it does not matter. So when it comes to business, what problem are you solving? Not what your solution is, what problem are you solving? And, and, and then identify who's having that problem. And then if you can articulate that and, and people can see that, the reason I love capital, ca capitalism so much is like you are going to get paid for the problems that you're solving. And, and, for the, and some people can call it value, but I want to be very clear because a lot of people are talking about value and it's like sometimes it's just like it goes over our head and we just have to understand that. So a, a big problem that I see is a lot of people get too romantic about their idea and they are not actually making money. So that's number one. Number two is once you're making money, it's um, a big mistake is very few people are saving money and having an emergency account. And th there's unsexy things about an emergency account, but what's the rate of return of having just capital on hand? Um, for us, our company grew during this whole COVID thing because um, we hired people, we took advantage of opportunities. Um, it was cheaper to advertise during a certain period. And so we were able to say yes in a time period where most people are panicking because just like most of Americans, most businesses are running, you know, week to week or month to month. So a, a key thing is like understand the profit first mentality and pay yourself first and build up a reserve, especially if you're a business owner. And don't get too romantic about real estate. Don't get too romantic about gold. Don't get too romantic about any of that until you have a foundation because the greatest asset that you own is yourself and your ability to work and your ability to build a business and make sure you're building a moat around your castle before you go out and try to make more money. The biggest, actually the biggest mistake, because I work with a lot of people that do what you guys are doing. The biggest mistake is we, we have this like desire to get every money, all our money in motion. And so I've seen, I have clients that over leverage themselves because they want every single dollar working. And then when everything hits the fan, they, they are making decisions because they have no money they're asset rich and they're cash poor. So I think another big mistake that people make when they're running business is they don't have proper cash or cash equivalents on hand to, um, ha you know, cause everything takes more time and money. I, I call it the 1.5% rule. <laughs> uh, and whatever you want to do, multiply it by 1.5, whether it's money or time, and that's going to be more accurate. I, well, I love, love oh, go ahead. Andy. I was just going to say, I love, uh, I love that you mentioned profit first, Mike Michalowicz. We've had him on the podcast. He's uh, besides Robert Kiyosaki, I'd say one of the other people that has really driven a big change in, in my day to day. Um, he also has clockwork. We've talked about it a ton on this podcast. Once again, you know, those are as, as far as I'm concerned, essential reading. Yep. Um, so uh, anyway, Amy, <laughs> back to you. <laughs> no, I was just going to say that, you know, when you're talking about the emergency fund, I learned about the concept. Well, I guess, I grew up really poor. <laughs> we were not on the rich side of Wisconsin, that's for sure. Um, but, you know, I grew up really poor. And so I kind of grew up in a mentality of I want to put as much, save as much money as possible and earn as much money as possible because I don't want to be poor anymore. Right. And that was kind of my mentality. And then after I joined the military, um, I discovered Dave Ramsey. And I started listening to Dave Ramsey's podcast and he talked about you know, this idea of everybody's living in payments, you know, everybody's, you know, got a car payment and a house payment and a, and a credit card payment and everything else. And he talked about, he broke that down. He helped me to understand where if I have an emergency fund and if I don't have all this debt, I suddenly am going to feel so much richer. And when something comes along, I'm not going to panic. And so Really, I, I embraced Dave Ramsey's principles and I really, that, that emergency fund, I still use to this day and I still use that principle in my business. I, that's what I did during COVID. I like socked away the cash, right? I grew the business, socked away the cash, got lean, looked at everything, went, okay, we're bleeding over here. Let's stop that bleeding. Let's save this money over here. But I'm with you, Caleb, when you say that what a lot of Amazon sellers do is they yep. feel this immense pressure. There's a lot of 
gurus out there that are that say that the secret to getting to that million dollars is just keep launching new products keep launching new products but you're right if yeah. you launch a me too product that you're not that doesn't look any different than anybody else's you're going to be competing on price and reviews right. and if you just bought 10,000 units <laughs> And suddenly you're not able to sell them. And then you've launched three new products with whatever money came in. All of a sudden, like you said, you've got all this inventory and you got no money. Yep. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I'm all about like, hey, can we stop for a second yep. and think about what value we're offering? What brand we're really building? Are we building a brand with value or are we building a product? Yeah. That's yeah, you you opened thing. up a can of worms with Dave Ramsey. Just warning you, if you guys. Okay, well, yes, you want yeah, the- I agree because Dave does not know how to leverage debt. So after <laughs> after that, I definitely learned how to leverage debt, and I use that yeah. in my business, and I have a lot of available cash flow because I learned those principles. Yeah. But yeah. I do yeah. love his principle about the uh, yeah. about the um, emergency fund. I think that's a good principle. Yeah. Here's what I would say with Dave Ramsey. I have a lot of respect for him and he's talking to a group of people that are not listening to this show that are like deep in credit card debt that are not necessarily like they're, they just, they're just spending more money than they're making and they need someone to scream at them and say, cut up your credit cards. And by the way, those people are not using credit cards. Well, they're not using debt well. And so it's putting them behind. So I respect that. But what frustrates me is when people try to build wealth, on his principle. I mean, you just, you even take what he tells you to do, pay off your house and then put your money in 12% mutual funds. You actually listen to his advice and he's right. It's like a five or $6 million mistake because of town value of money. And so I, I have a chapter in my book that actually addresses the mortgage because I feel like so many people are so emotional about this that I address it from efficiency. So chapter three talks all about like, should you pay off your house? This is how I think about debt. And um, I, I think I think Dave Ramsey gets people on the right track, but then yeah. building wealth, I would not listen to not listen to his principles on building wealth because yeah. um, they, yeah, that's that's. I I learned so much uh, when I got into this side of business, and you know, besides the Robert Kiyosaki side of things, but you know, when I learned how to leverage debt, I mean, I I had to kind of let go of everything that I learned from Dave Ramsey. I'm like it's fine. You know, I'm going to leverage this amazing capital yep. that I have um, and, access to. And just, just for the debt, this is how I think of debt. Um, n- number one, there's, there's good debt and there's bad debt. And a lot of people get it mixed up with what you purchase. So it's like, oh, a car loan's a bad loan. No, um, maybe buying a car with a loan is a bad decision, <laughs> but, but just be, a loan doesn't make it bad. So right. one thing I like about Dave Ramsey is if you pay cash for a house, if you pay cash for a car, you end up buying something maybe more in your price range. But once you make a decision on what you purchase, then the next question is, what's the most efficient way to do that? And and newsflash, this is something I didn't know when I first got in, but every decision you make, you are financing. If you pay interest to somebody, you're paying interest. If you pay cash, you are losing interest because you're disrespecting what that dollar could be worth for you the rest of your life. So I paid cash for my first car. I graduated college debt-free. I did all this stuff because I grew up on Dave Ramsey. I thought like, this is the way to go. But I didn't realize that by paying cash, I was actually losing a whole lot more money because that my money was never able was to work for me. And it was yeah. gone. So it was gone. yeah, you just spent twenty thousand dollars on a car. Yeah. And now you don't have that money coming in to be able to use to invest in more assets. Right. Thanks for tuning in to part one of this episode. Join us every Tuesday at 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time for live QA and bonus content after the recording at sellerroundtable.com. Sponsored by the ultimate software tool for Amazon sales and growth, SellerSEO.com and AmazingAtHome.com.